Good morning. As the end of our, uh, as the end of our prelude, uh, I'd like to introduce Mr. Paul Ingboldstad. I apologize, his name didn't get in the bulletin uh, this morning, but um, I'll invite him to begin us. on in endless song amid earth's lamentations I feel the real though far off him that hails a new creation No storm can shake my inmost calm While to that rock I'm clinging It sounds an echo in my soul How can I keep from singing around me roars I know my Savior liveth what though the darkness round me close songs in the night he giveth no storm can shake my inmost calm while to that rock I'm clinging it sounds an echo in my soul now can I keep from singing storm can shake my inmost calm while to that rock I'm clinging since Christ is Lord of heaven and earth how can I keep from singing Please rise. We gather for worship in the same way that we live the rest of our lives. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the source of all mercy and the God of all consolation. He comforts us in all our sorrows so that we can comfort others in their sorrows with the consolation we ourselves have received from God. When we were baptized into Christ Jesus, we were baptized into his death. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might live a new life. 
For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his as well. Let us pray. God of all grace and glory, we remember before you today our brother Les. We thank you for giving him to us to know and to love as a companion in our pilgrimage on earth. In your boundless compassion, console us who mourn. Give us your aid so that we may see in death the gate to eternal life, that we may continue our course on earth in confidence until by your call we are reunited with those who have gone before us. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. family has invited three people to speak today, so I'll invite them up in turn to the lectern where the microphone is. So um, first Richard, then James, uh, and then Dorothy. Hello. Les Josephson, number 34. Les's mother said this. All of my children were born at home on the farm, but I was going to have Lester at the hospital. But I didn't get there. Lester came too soon. Less than a yard, not off left tackle or right tackle, 
right over center for a touchdown <laughs> on the family farm. Les was born. Les saw daylight for the first time near the small town of Miniota, southwestern Minnesota, about 20 miles east of the South Dakota line. Population, about 1,300 in 1942, pretty much the same today. <laughs> Not far away is Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Was it down Highway 26, is it? South? Where he would later attend Augustana University. Get married and begin a family. A son, a daughter. But back to the farm. Les had his chores, of course, feeding animals, before heading off to a one-room schoolhouse a mile and a half away. He walked, rode a bike, and sometimes rode, rode a pony. Later, it was off to the town school. That's what they called it. That was the high school. Les was a great athlete and excelled at track and field. Les told me his high school team went undefeated for at least two seasons. Imagine that, two seasons undefeated high school football. He had a great tenor voice, won singing contests, was a soloist in the choir, and was given a scholarship in music to St. Olaf College. And though track and field and music and singing were great loves, football made a career. He chose Augustana University down the road in Sioux Falls. Les went from playing eight-man ball in high school, went undrafted out of college, but his athleticism and fearlessness, fearlessness on the field was noticed by the Dallas Cowboys, who in turn traded Les to the Rams. And that's where I first saw him, because I grew up in L.A. Four years later, he was in the NFL Pro Bowl backfield and scored the game's first touchdown. How many pro football players that played a decade with greats in the league, like Merlin Olson, Deacon Jones, Dick Butkus, and Bob Lilly, did it that way? As I said, I grew up in the L.A. area, and my dad took me to Rams games in the 50s. Back then, back then, the names were Waterfield, Van Brocklin, Crazy Legs Hirsch, Deacon Dan Tower, and uh, Night Train Lane. In the late 60s, the names were Roman Gabriel, Deacon Jones, Merlin Olson, Jack Snow, Lamar, Lamar Lundy, and Les Josephson. I didn't know then that I'd be here now reflecting on a friendship with Les that started with an invitation to have beer with a group of men that met each Thursday at 4 p.m. I am a poet and an electrician, and most of these guys were mortgage brokers, appraisers, real estate agents, upper management types at IBM and Rolls-Royce, a pediatrician, a policeman, mining and civil engineers, owners of tire shops, an NFL halfback, and some from a stock exchange and commodities background. Many had relocated from the east. Most were retired. I fit right in. <laughs> we melded as a group, added new friends, but now many have passed. And now our football star and mortgage broker, Les Josephson, has as well. I think Les is the only one of us with his own Wikipedia page. In clouds of dust or on muddy or frozen fields, a few yards gained. It could be enough for a first down, or it could be short and fourth down. For less, many were touchdowns on the grassy field of the Coliseum. Big men crashing into each other, 10 years and 3,000 yards gained of busting tackles, getting tackled, 
of finding that opening through the line. I recall many times at many different pubs that we were at with the men's group, uh, Charlie and Les, Charlie's in the audience here, talking about football games nobody else recalled from the long past. It was great hearing those old stories. When asked by the LA Times in 1971 what advice he'd give to a young football player hoping for a career in the NFL, Les said, get a good doctor. <laughs> Les had a great sense of humor and delivered a jab with a twinkle in his eye. Les had many operations on his body. His Achilles tear kept him out, but he came back. That's tough to do. After football, Les acted in Hollywood movies, relocated to Tucson, had a packaging business, a copier business, and was a successful mortgage broker. About this time, Les went to a wine tasting. When he got back, he told his roommate buddy and business partner, partner Jim that he found the woman he would marry and that Jim would have to move out. <laughs> uh, Jim's going to be up here after me and uh, he can expand on that. The woman was and is Donna, the love of Les's life. So many of us have shared time with Les and Donna at their foothills home for those fabulous Super Bowl parties. Many in this sanctuary church members and Les and Donna's friends throughout Tucson and our Thursday men's group have attended. Many times Les and I were down here loading up our trucks with the church's chairs and tables for the party. This church was a big part of Les and Donna's lives. Les lent his beautiful tenor voice to the church choir. This time last year, we didn't know. The 2019 Super Bowl party would be the last. Les and Donna didn't know they had made their last big RV trip around the nation. They didn't know Les would lose his driving privileges and that Donna would become ill. I picked up Les a few months ago to meet with the boys at Putney. It's our watering hole up Oracle Road from Les and Donna's home. I was surprised when he asked me, where are we going? I had my iPhone plugged into the radio playing a mix of my favorites, and up came the old favorite, that sea shanty. Oh, Shenandoah. you rolling river. And Les sang it word for word. A solo with his beautiful tenor voice in my car. It took him to another place, another time, back to high school choir. That song, that song chokes me up as it is. And to have that big sweet man who could not move without pain. Who gave great bear hugs to my daughters at Super Bowl parties. To have Les singing it like that is a memory I shall cherish. But Les's last year was like a rigged football game. There was no playbook. No one was blocking for him. A few yards gained brought the goalposts no closer. It was always fourth and long. It was a tough year. Les and Donna ended up in the same hospital room. 
Theirs was a great love. He wanted Donna. He hadn't seen her for about 10 days since she was re relocated to another facility. He was alone. That powerful man, powerless. Not a way to live, not a way to live. There is a loneliness singular to the death of a parent, a sibling, a spouse, that is not a seasonal sorrow, is not felt in the yellowing and falling of leaves from a deciduous tree, but rather in the felling of that tree, the burning of its wood in winter, and the mixing of its ashes in our soil that reminds our memory of the shade it made in our youth when we climbed its branches, when in its arms our view was not diminished by distance or time. When summer and sunlight were sufficient. I'd like to thank Richard for those beautiful words that he spoke about Les, our friend, a very, very special man. For those that do not know me, my name is James and I was Les's friend for over 40 years. We met shortly after Les moved to Tucson when he bought a Yorkshire Terrier from my previous wife. I don't understand our friendship. It was one of those spontaneous things that went on all our whole lives. We were young men when we met. And at one point, I moved in with Les into a spare bunk room, and we lived together for several years. Then he went off to the wine tasting party, as Richard alluded to, and he came back telling me about this wonderful, beautiful woman he met, the dancer, the ballroom dancer. And when I met her, I understood. She was not only beautiful, but graceful. And they got married. And we got married right here in this church. And it was such a beautiful day with Scott and Terry and everybody here. Les and Donna then lived later after that on Camino de Fasfero up in the foothills. And at Scott's graduation party that Les threw, we had our first pig roast. We took a beautiful pig, wrapped it up, and we found it the loyal order of the pig. <laughs> yes, to become a member, Les said you have to kiss the snout of the pig. <laughs> well, we cooked that pig 24 hours over coal from in a pit in the ground and then unwrapped it, and we partied and drank kegs of beer because Les did know how to throw a party. And the pig roast became an annual event for a while. Then they moved down to the new home on Genomatis. When they were building that house, that house was built just for Les and Donna. They had it the way they wanted it to be. And I never will forget the contractor put the stove, the fireplace, in the wrong place, and they had to move it. Yes, they had a beautiful life there and a beautiful home and many, many beautiful weekends and days. In Tucson, Les did have three businesses before going into the mortgage industry. And one of them was a business machine company. And he asked me to leave the university hospital and go to work with him in his tech division. And those were good times and a long time. Les came to San Diego when I was living out there, and we went with Donna to Super Bowl parties from the alumni, where we got to see all the greats, and he introduced me to all these people that he used to play with. Les was a very humble man. He never really bragged about all the great things he did, but he was also a very special individual. He had love and a heart, a heart that was very big. When he first started in the mortgage industry, he would go to Nogales once a week to sit down and meet realtors. And he met and got to be friends with a man who owned a produce distribution company. And he'd take his truck and have it loaded up with boxes of fresh vegetables and fruits that couldn't be sold for whatever reason. And then he would deliver them to elementary schools so that underprivileged children could take food home to their families. 
He never said anything about it. He just did that week in, week out, without any acknowledgement. In our later years, Les and I would sit on the back porch and we'd smoke a cigar, drink a little bourbon, look out at the lights of the city, and we'd just talk as two friends do. I was in Hawaii with my wife on vacation this summer, and like Les and I would often do, we spoke on the phone. And after we hung up the phone, I looked at my wife and I said, something's wrong, I don't know what, but I need to go to Tucson. When we returned to Hawaii, I came out, and Donna explained to me about his memory issues and that things were not well. So we returned right before Christmas with my wife for a week to visit with them. And I saw Les and Donna together. It reminded me of the movie in the notebook, two people caring and loving. It was shortly after that that Donna had to go in the hospital and I got the fateful call on January 1st that my friend had passed. I can only say to you this much, Les was a man with miles and miles of heart and a good man, and this world has lost somebody wonderful. I thank you very much. Les and Donna met at a party on a Saturday evening, as you have heard here. What do you think and where was their first date? Here's a pro football player. He's seen and had a lot of experiences with different people, high, low. He's a member of the Screen Actors Guild and has all these experiences in Hollywood and so on. Where do you take somebody you just met on your first date. The day after he met her, Les brought Donna here to this church to attend a church service. Not many people can say, Donna, that they went to church on their first date. Obviously, his church was very important to him. When Les first joined this church, he didn't join the choir right away, but he did serve as a lector. And as you can imagine, he did a very good job at that. And when he did join the choir, we were all blessed by his talent. Ask any choir director to describe their dream choir member. It would be someone who can sing on pitch, someone who can sing on tempo and not lag, someone who can read music, someone whose voice can blend in. Les was all of those things. Not only that, he was always on time for rehearsals and always came with a smile, that beautiful, gentle smile of his. Les was very humble. I'm sure a lot of us here didn't realize the extent of his acting career until you looked at your bulletin in the back. When new choir members joined our choir, they had no idea that Les was a professional football player. Their first inkling, though, would be when Les would hand out those marvelous invitations to his and Donna's fantastic Super Bowl parties. Oh, we're going to miss those parties, Donna. There's, we were memorable and gave us all so much fun. Les and Donna also graciously and lavishly hosted many choir parties over the years. And Donna, the choir cannot thank you enough for all that you and Les did for us. Over the years, we watched as it became harder and more painful for Les to walk. The choir comes forward to sing every Sunday, and he did it, although you knew it was very painful for him to do it, but didn't stop him from singing. Last spring, when Les could no longer drive to choir rehearsals, that also didn't stop him from singing. Dear Donna brought him to rehearsals 
sat through the rehearsals doing her puzzles, but laughingly she declined to join us to sing. <laughs> what will we miss about Les? First of all, we're going to miss his presence in our midst, his gentle countenance, his voice, his beautiful smile, and his devotion to his church. And what is his legacy to us here today? Les was, first and foremost, a man of faith who walked humbly before his God. Well done, good and faithful servant. There are four Bible passages chosen for today. First is Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his namesake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. A reading from Revelation chapter 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more, mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. Those who conquer will inherit these things, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. Psalm 121. I lift my eyes to the hills. From where will my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time on and forevermore. And finally, a reading from Romans chapter 8. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us 
from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's pray. God of all comfort and peace, wash over us today with your presence and help us to see your spirit at work in our time together. Give us confidence to speak in all our emotion to you who know our grief and know our burden as we gather here today. Amen. Grace and peace to you from God our Father, the Spirit, and our Lord Jesus the Christ. Amen. We're gathered here today because of the life of Les Josephson. We're here to celebrate and to remember, to laugh and to cry, to call out to God and to be heard, and to find hope for the lives that still we have left to live out on this earth. To that end, we have chosen these readings from Scripture, a reading from the book of Revelation, a reading from Paul's letter to the Romans, and two psalms, Psalm 23 and 121. Very often on occasions like today, we turn to the psalms, and rightfully so. The psalms are the ancient songbook of Israel. Psalms are poetry and history and poetry and song and prayer. And Psalm 23 is the greatest of these. It is the greatest because uh, it's meaningful poetry and it speaks to us on a deep level, but even beyond that, people of other faiths are familiar with it. It is one of the greatest pieces of poetry ever. And those outside the church often can recite it by heart. That's how important it is. It is comforting to hear of the great shepherd who protects us and provides for us and cares for us even in the dark valley or the presence of enemies. Psalm 121 comes from a special group of songs. These are called the Songs of Ascent. Psalm 120 to 134 are songs that the people of Israel sang as they went up to Jerusalem for festivals. Faithful Jews would make pilgrimages several times a year to Jerusalem for the festivals, and they were very familiar with these songs that they would sing along the way. And no matter where they were coming from, they would have to go up to Jerusalem because Jerusalem sits on top of a hill. So, it is really a visual when the psalmist sings, I lift my eyes to the hills, from where will my help come? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. The songs of ascent have long been, long been traveling music for the people of Israel. And we choose this psalm today for our reading because it's traveling music for us on our journey as well. We gather here to hear the traveling music that we need for the remainder of our walk of faith. When I am in trouble, the Lord is my help. He keeps me from falling. He guards my path. He protects me day and night. He keeps me safe from this time on and forevermore. Today we are reminded of God's provision for us, no matter where we travel. The book of Revelation is oftentimes misused or at the very least mischaracterized as a, a, a being only about damnation and destruction and devastation. But the revelation that was revealed to the Apostle John while he was in prison on the island of Patmos, the revelation is much more, than, uh, much more a word of encouragement than a word of damnation. Encouragement for the early church that was suffering from fear, abuse, and persecution. And in the face of the struggles of the early church, John shares this vision, shares this vision with them as a powerful picture of how, in the end, God wins. And when God wins, it looks like this. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. 
The new heaven and the new earth are the ultimate promise of God's healing. And the sea is always represented in Hebrew mythology as a place of chaos, lawlessness, and destruction. So to say that the sea is no more means God does, does away with all of those things in the world that destroy. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. An amazing vision of God coming to us. In some warped form, we have allowed ourselves to believe that we need to somehow earn our forgiveness or we need to work our way up to God when the Bible says the exact opposite. God comes to us where we are. And if we didn't catch it the first time, John adds this, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, see the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them. This is God's hope for us. This is God's intention for us. And this is the reality that John reminds the early church of in his apocalyptic writing. God's desire for, from the beginning has been the renewal of relationship and the restoration of all things. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more for the first things have passed away. I especially like that last part because it echoes the way in which we usually speak of those who have died by saying that they have passed away. But what God has to say is this, that death itself and mourning and crying and pain are what will pass away. Oh, how we long for that. For today, it seems that death and mourning and crying and pain are winning. And it may be hard to put our trust in the promise of God's future, which then brings us to our reading from the book of Romans. Paul's letter to the early church in Rome is full of discipline and correction. Paul tries to redirect the church, to straighten out where they've strayed, but it's also a strong encouragement for them not to give in and not to give up. In the midst of the struggles the early church was facing, in the midst of the struggles that our modern church is facing, Paul speaks straight to the struggling. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. Those are hard words to hear when we're actually suffering. In the actual realities of suffering in our life, it can be hard to trust and to hope and even look up sometimes. But Paul is even more profound in his encouraging. He explains that when we are too worn out to pray, when we are distraught and can't find words, even our sighing is a prayer that God hears. The Spirit intercedes for us with sighs too deep for words. God hears the prayers of our hearts, and even when we can't make them into words, God hears them. And finally, there is this familiar list that Paul gives of all the things that we might think have more power than God, of all the things that sound strong and mighty, angels, rulers, powers, heights, depths, None of them can keep God away from us. There is nothing that can keep us apart from God's love for us and the love of God whose name is Jesus. You may have your own list of those things that you think are mighty and powerful, those things that can't be healed, but your list is just like Paul's. Your list cannot prevail. So today, here in this place, we gather to celebrate Les's life. We gather to be reminded that God's provision is with us in all the places that we travel in our life of faith. And we gather to be encouraged in our journey of faith by our confession, our confession of God's love that sounds a lot like Paul. But in our words today, I think it would sound like this. For I am convinced 
that neither death nor life nor traumatic head injury nor abuse or illness or addiction or injury nor anything else in all of creation can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Be thou triune God in the midst of us as we give thanks for those who have gone from the side of our earthly eyes. They now in your nearer presence still worship with us in the mystery of the one family in heaven and on earth. If it be your holy will, tell our loved ones how much we love them and how much we miss them and how we long for the day when we shall meet with them again. Strengthen us to go on in loving service of all your children. Thus shall we have communion with you and in you with our dearest loved ones. Thus shall we come to know within ourselves that there is no death and that only a veil divides here from there, a veil as thin as gossamer. Amen. Please rise. Together we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have knit your chosen people together in one communion, in the mystical body of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Give to your whole church in heaven and on earth your light and your peace. Grant that all who have been baptized into Christ's death and resurrection may die to sin and rise to newness of life, that through the grave and gate of death we may pass with him into our joyful resurrection. Help us, we pray, in the midst of things we cannot understand, to believe and trust in the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection to life everlasting. Give us grace 
to entrust less to your love which sustained him in this life. Receive him in your mercy and remember him according to the favor you show for your people. God, the generations rise and pass away before you. You are the strength of those who labor. You are the rest of the blessed dead. We rejoice in the company of your saints. We remember all who have lived in faith and all who have peacefully died, and especially those most dear to us who rest in you. Give us in time our portion with those who have trusted in you and have striven to do your holy will. To your name, with the church on earth and the church in heaven, we ascribe all honor and glory now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We'll end with our uh, closing hymn, hymn number 836 in your red hymnal. Um, as we sing this, the family will process out to the garden and where we'll go uh, to spread the uh, Lessa's ashes in the memorial garden. If you would like to join us, there are a few copies of the bulletin we'll be using out there. The ushers have those on, their, on our way out. Um, if not, you may uh, just go straight to the activity building and join us for the reception afterward. One of the things that's really important about our gathering is sharing of stories, and the reception is a, is a holy time for us to do that together. It's just as important as the time we spend in here. Hymn number 837, or 836.